Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Lightning Talks on day three. Um, please, if there are any presenters or possible presenters in the room, please sit in the front row because it's easier and then much faster to change uh, the presenters on stage. As you all know, you have five minutes to present your talk. Four minutes. Yeah, thanks, Nix. Um, okay. Well, I think I skipped the if you have an open seat next to you, raise your hands dial part. And um, the official time is 11.30, so let's start. Nick, are you ready? No. Nick, you are not ready. Well, yeah, because everybody decided to require their slides by USB, so that's what I've been... Uh, okay, so we have some more time to kill. And uh, I think I have to leave Nick alone. But that gives us some more time to actually welcome some more visitors to this uh, lecture hall. Yeah. Unfortunately, we have microphones as well. Somebody of the speakers wanted to have it. Yes, we have one. Time for more coffee. Delicious. Night. Well, okay, I will start with you, Nick. How much sleep did you get last night? That's classified. Okay. Was it a two-digit number? I presume no. Did anybody sleep for more than 10 hours last night? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> okay. Let, okay, let's... even, oh wait, wait, Sven, even if they did, oh, I, I apologize, even if you, even if you guys did end up sleeping for more than 10 hours last night, would you admit it? Yeah. Probably okay. not. Well, I, take a poll on that. Ask yes, them. yes, yes, a quick poll on the audience. How long did you sleep? Did you sleep more than one hour? Raise your hand. Okay, did you sleep more than three hours? Yeah. Uh, Keep your hands raised. More than three hours, yes, okay. More than five hours, okay, hands are dropping. More than seven hours, okay. So we have some very slept, uh, outslept, uh, what, what is the right word, Nick, I don't know. But most of you, less than seven hours. I think, is, it, is this uh, the good average for a Congress? I presume yes. Nick, how's it going? status of your... You've given me like a minute and 30 seconds. What am I supposed to... I've loaded like okay, three I, sets I, of slides. I, I'll tell you what, how, how we do this. Um, I give you a one minute sign and you have one minute and then I have 30 seconds and then... You, you do realize I can fire you, right? <laughs> like I think you have to uh, accept the fact that you have to get some of your own medicine. <laughs> But you have one advantage, I won't kick you off the stage because that would kill the effect uh, completely, okay. Yeah. I, I figured if, any, if it was like anything from yesterday, people are gonna come in under time and so I'll just use that time in advance. <laughs> which, which I figure is fair because if people are throwing slides at me 23 hours and 50, eight minutes after I told them that they could. I, I think that's fair. It's just, you know, I'll let that slide. The speakers will let me setting things up a little late slide. It, it all works out in the end, right? Sure. All right, but uh, so, Steve, you're here, right? Oh, why did I schedule the stretch break so late? Uh, we're almost, we're almost there. Almost. We do actually have a stretch break. Have people seen the full updated schedule on the wiki? Actually, could we just go ahead and turn on my the uh, video to the laptop? If you put on turn on your auxiliary video output, then yes. No, it should be because it's already it should there. Should be on. Hmm. You try to fix it. Can some of the video guys try to put on Nick's screen on the Beamer? Okay. 
might be a layer 8 problem. It was this resolution yesterday. It detected it because it changed the. Uh... Well, that sucks. All the preparation, all the kill time, and at the end, we come up with a problem. Mm. Too bad. I hate it. I'm sorry. I, it, it wasn't Nick's fault. <laughs> so I think you look prepared to the extent that you can be prepared for the such an event. We need some more video. I hope it works again. <laughs> Please have a round of applause for whoever made this possible. Maybe Nick Fowl. Actually, in spite of all of this, we're actually going to start on time. So, and then I guess, unfortunately, unfortunately, Shack Space is not there. So, oh, that, but I really wanted the peace missions to actually get get in there. I'm just gonna, okay, so how many were here yesterday? If you guys were here in the Lightning Talks yesterday. Okay, so we've got a couple of newbies here this morning. Um, the way this works is every presentation has four minutes uh, to give all of their slides. Everybody's slides are on my laptop, preloaded and ready to go. The way it works is when the presenter jumps up on stage, their presentation will come up. When they want to go to their next slide, if they have more slides, just say very quickly, slide. The one exception this morning is Steve from Luxembourg because he's got a presentation with 44 slides and he has his own little clicker. Yeah, of course. Whoa. Um. Well, he's, he's giving you a presentation on how to present, so I figured I'd let him get away with it. 
Um, <laughs> if possible, also go just go directly up to the podium, do some quick testing on the microphone. And then I, when you're starting your presentation, um, you'll have four minutes. At the time you reach one minute, I will say one minute. I will give you also a 30 second warning. And then when it gets, when you get to the 10 second mark, if you're still talking, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go like this. <laughs> and that's exactly what you guys are going to do. Now, if the presenter reaches the 30 second point, he can, and this is a new rule today, uh -oh. he can ask for more time. Ooh. He can ask for a one minute extension. Now, if when he asks for more time, what, if you guys want to give him more time, <laughs> just clap and say, yeah, yeah, yeah. And at that point, when I deem that the audience is sufficiently ready to give him more time, I will then give him a new one minute mark and start from there. However, if you don't want him to have more time, just go ahead and say boo or pr practice now. If you don't want to give a speaker more time, just go. And then the speaker will have to stop at the designated time. Now as soon as the speaker, <laughs> as soon as the speaker is finished, thank the audience and then the next speaker, you should know who you are. I'll pop your slides up, come up on stage when you're ready to go, we'll go. The record for fastest talk was actually set yesterday at two minutes and 42 seconds. There's no need to try to beat that record, but uh, if you do, that'll allow us to have a little bit more time for everybody else. So without any further ado, Steve, you ready to go? I am. All right, let me just get the timer set up very quickly. Okay, I am Steve Clement. And on three, ready? One, <laughs> two, three. Okay, hi. Um, thanks for coming after the Fenelit party. You must be shattered. And today, I will present you a little thing about presenting. First of all, lightning talks are generally well presented. Why? You have four minutes, so no time to fuck it up. If you have an hour, all of a sudden you fuck it up majorly. Um, a couple of pointers. Be on time, very important, Ninik, um, or rather before time, uh, and then also start on time, because it's uh, a matter of respect before your audience to actually start on time. Um, know the venue, so from the technical difficulties, as we had here, to any roadblocks or any uh, snow chaos uh, in between. Test your demo if you have a demo, and if you fail, bad luck, better test it next time. And also, uh, basically, yeah, do apologize and no bullshit about it being not perfect. So, um, another thing, value your audience. Compliment them at the beginning so they already like you, otherwise they will throw you off the stage. Um, and I'll always show a couple of uh, exciting moments uh, and also if they leave, uh, just tell them that you're happy that they still till the end. Brief your audience, my talk will take four minutes in theory. Uh, a couple of rules of the game, if there are no pictures to be taken, just tell them that. And also put a time constraint up to, from the beginning so people are always under tension uh, and they know how uh, long it will take. Um, where is the love and most of all, where is the passion? I see a lot of talks and they are not passionate about their subject. Come on, it's your subject. Be passionate about it, otherwise no one will listen to you. Um, distinguish with yourself with a set of special slides. I usually do that by putting a license on my talks uh, because most of all general management doesn't know what a license is. Uh, and then at the end, I also apologize because I usually break a couple of copyright rules, but honestly, I don't give a fuck. Uh, be calm, know your stuff, do not present anything that you don't know about. Uh, the be calm part is a bit tricky because obviously you're nervous, there are people, and there's only one way to get past that. Do a lot of talks, do a lot of lightning talks, and then you get calm with time. Be confident about your stuff because, well, you know your shit. If you're not confident, people will notice that and then they will walk out of the room. Body language, also very important because if you hide, over here, like that, confidence is gone and no one will listen to you, so just, yeah, show yourself uh, and just be open towards the audience. Do not just keep everything to yourself. All these tricks are very similar to social engineering. And then keep the text on the slides to a bare minimum, because, <laughs> then you can applaud, that's okay. <laughs> You can use pictures instead. This is debatable. If you, d if you give an acad academic uh, lecture, well, pictures is not really ideal. 
Um, let's face it, PowerPoints are just uh, mega interesting, but uh, they are not useful. Um, minute, okay. And then designs, obviously this hasn't been designed by a designer, but it is very important that you actually get a nice design. And then keep it to minimum, white on black is uh, okay, just don't use Comic Sans. Interact with your audience, just... <laughs> Bullshit Bingo, who doesn't know Bullshit Bingo should look it up, it's actually quite funny to uh, play. And then get to know your audience who is sitting in front of you. You are the presentation, fuck all of this, don't read it, sleep a lot, try to speak properly. Gym for your tongue, very interesting, also uh, helps for other things. Um, you can actually pause for thought, so you can make a small break of two seconds to think. Um, Eye to eye with nearly everyone and not eye to boob. For some of you, that might be the case. You want to ask for more time? Can I get some more time? 30 seconds. <laughs> Thanks for the boo. Okay, a couple of killers. If you have the uh, uh problem, well, then just uh, try speak uh, aloud in front of a mirror, for instance. Rehearse your. Um, your presentation, again, in front of the mirrors and aloud, and preferably in your target language. If your English is not that good, maybe do it in German or otherwise. Dealing with fuck-ups, everything can be salvaged. Uh, you can always explain why you fucked up. And to become the best presenter, wide and bright, that's a Luxembourgish joke, you won't get it. 30 seconds. Um, pick any topic and make a uh, PowerPoint presentation about it, like nuclear fission. Just try and do it impro. And if you can do that properly, and you can convince someone that you know shit about nuclear fission, well, then you're really good. Uh, a couple of things I forgot. Water is important. Apologies, you can. Nine, eight, <laughs> Thank you very much indeed. All right. Thank you, Steve. Yep. Give him another round of applause for being the first today and having so many slides. That was really cool. Okay, next up, uh, Willow, you can go ahead and introduce yourself. And I think you're actually starting reasonably on time. So yeah, actually, that was great. You guys picked up on the more time rule, 10, 9, 8. And so I think in the interest of keeping us ahead of time, Whenever you're ready, I will give you a three to one countdown, then you go. So three, two, one. Okay, I'm Willow Brew. I'm from Jigsaw Renaissance in Seattle, Washington. It's a making and co-working space, co-working for people with dirty hands. And slide. Um, just slide, 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 please. <laughs> Perfect, okay, so. Um, Co-working, hacking, and making spaces, I think they're all hacking spaces. If hacking is the altering and uh, toying with systems that other people take for granted, um, they're just different aspects of the same thing. Okay. Um, <laughs> in America, will you do slides again? Okay. Slide. Slide. I'm used to doing this as a Prezi. Slide again. There we go. Okay, so in America, we have to worry about similar things. Uh, documents, accounting, bylaws, insurance. The Venn diagram overlap of trying to figure out zoning. Jigsaw is zoned as a retail space, which means we have to sell something, so we sell membership. But that means insurance won't cover anybody that isn't a member, and trying to teach them, or like, kids are okay, we're gonna teach them how to use power tools, but we'll teach them first. I hope they don't saw off their hands. They don't like it. And I would rather be rebuilding engines than doing paperwork. So we like to automate the parts that suck. Slide. Again. Okay, so um, we have a couple spaces that have all linked together. Bucket Works in Milwaukee was established in 2002. It is now 27,000 square feet. It's the world's first health club for the brain. Um, and because they had already figured out so much, I didn't have to do so much paperwork. So when Jigsaw was established in Seattle in 2009, we just got to start making things instead of figuring out how all this stuff works. Slide. So now we have also Sector 67, which just opened, and um, Pumping Station 1 and Level 1 um, already existed but are now using fiscal sponsorship so they get some benefits without having to do any more paperwork. Yay, paperwork. And together, this is all the Space Federation. Slide. 
because um, we like Star Trek and it's a federation of spaces. Um, <laughs> so the contents of these spaces, the containers, are things like Bar Camp Milwaukee um, Chronology, which happened at uh, Bucket Works, which was an established artist. Her mother had kept every piece of her art, so you got to see 8,000 square feet of the evolution of her artistic ability. Amazing. Um, also, Remade, which is a documentary coming out of Pumping Station One. Open Door Hackathon, which is trying to get everybody on similar systems so we can share membership a little bit better. And something like uh, Geeks Without Bounds, which is linking up hacker and maker communities to humanitarian organizations so they have better tools so they don't have to worry about what they're pressing and can just go actually One help minute. save lives. Thank you. Um, so all this together, this is old slides, just leave it there. Um, all this together is the school factory. Why is it school factory? Because we want schools to look like spaces like Seabase in 2025. This is where people go to learn things when they care about them. We want it to be intergenerational, we want it to be passion-based. People should like to learn and our school system in America is really messed up, and rather than fix it, we're just gonna start something new and slowly take over. 30 second more time option. So if you want to, no, it's okay. Um, if you wanna get in touch with me about any of these, I'm willow at jigsawrenaissance.org, I'm willow at schoolfactory.org, or you can just find me on the internets as willow blue because of my hair. Thank you. And next up, domain cache credentials. For some reason, huh? Hmm? Uh, what was your? Oh, I did. I did skip you. I apologize for that. No, I got excited. That was my fault. Okay. Yeah, I did skip flock scrape because of a last-minute slide substitution. I think. So yeah, okay. flock, so flock I, scrape. Yeah, shall I start yeah. or flock scrape? So and change? Then, huh? So change? No, it's not good. Okay, I'll do it. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, yes. Okay, so, all right, now I think we're back on track. So. Okay, good morning, everybody. My name is oh. Matthias, and I want to talk lightning fast about domain cached credentials. Slide. Domain cached credentials are password information that are locally stored on Windows hosts if your Windows host is a member of a Windows domain. Um, domain cached credentials are provided for two functionalities, system access when a domain control is not available, and single sign-on. Um, the typical use case is mobile Windows devices, for example, laptop systems. So you can log on to your laptop system even if you don't have a network connection to your domain controller. Currently, there are two different domain cache credential hash types, um, one for pre-Windows Vista operating systems and one for all Windows operating systems um, from Vista onwards, so Windows 7, Windows Server 2008 slide. Um, okay. Um, of course, there are some configuration options for domain cache credentials. I just put this information on the slide for the sake of completeness. So you can disable um, caching completely. You can change the default setting of 10 cache domain credentials in the registry or uh, enable notifications if domain cache credentials are used for logon. Slide. Um, here are the two DCC hash algorithms in use. The first one is the old DCC hash algor uh, algorithm. Um, used for all operating systems pre-Windows Vista, and uh, in the red box you can see the new one. Um, the important part is that the new one is more expensive to calculate. You can see this um, at the duration count. It's 10,240 um, rounds of HMAC SHA-1. Actually, the pa password-based um, key derivation function 2 is used, so yeah, things got more complicated. And the DCC2 hash actually is the first uh, 128 bits of the output of the PKDF2 slide. Um, 
Yeah, as password recovery has become a market, that's of course commercial software for recovering these kind of hashes. I am currently aware of four um, software tools that can do this. Software tools by the usual suspects, uh, Alcomsoft and Passcape. And now there's also a free open source software tool that can recover the new uh, DCC hash type, namely John the Ripper with um, the MS cache to patch slide. Yeah, here I've put uh, some benchmarks on the slide on, uh, from my laptop system. And yeah, the first benchmark is the old DCC hash format. Here you can see that the performance has dropped from about uh, 44 million hashes per second down to 192 hashes per second. So yeah, things be, became very slow lately. Slide. So the conclusions are that the empire actually struck back. New domain cache credentials um, are, One minute. are a lot harder to calculate because um, the costs increased by order, by order of several magnitudes um, to attack these hashes. Sequential brute force attacks um, will take ages for um, yeah, usual search spaces, spaces. So there is an old new hope. Intelligent password attacks, um, namely rule-based dictionary attacks, mask attacks, probabilistic attacks, and some new kind of attacks I don't know yet. Slide. 30 yeah. second more time and option. Here you can find some information about the main cache credentials, the old hash type, the new hash type. And of course, you can download the MS Cache 2 patch from John the Ripper. It's on the open wall wiki um, since a few days. Thank you very much. All right, that clocked in at three minutes and 46 seconds. And so now we are going to go to Flock Scrape. Are you ready to go? Yeah. Okay, so you did a little bit of flipping around there, but after this one, hopefully we will be able to get. Okay, up. good morning, everyone. Oh, whoa, 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 hold up. I, Don't I haven't, give me at least time to tell you go so I can reset the stopwatch. So, but you're, you're, you're jumping, you're ready to go, you're, you're good? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Go. Hi, good morning. I want to talk to you about distributed scraping, but before I go into this, I want to uh, show why I'm interested in doing this slide. Um, so in September, we released this website called Offener Haushalt, which is essentially a scrape of the German uh, federal budget. Um, we're trying to visualize it. We're trying to make it more accessible to um, let, let people see what, what government spends money on. Slide. So now we've merged this with, with its uh, British counterpart called Where Does My Money Go? It's now one big engine. It's, uh, the idea is that if you have spending data, if you have financial data of any kind, and you want to explore it, you want to understand where the money is going, you can put it in there, and, and we'll give you various ways to explore it. Slide. Well, what you'll notice, though, is if you get good spending data, this is pretty good, this is easy spending, it's got lots of company names in it. That's kind of a criteria for good spending data, if you can see who actually got the money. The problem, of course, with that is that you need to find out more about these companies. So is this actually the same com uh, or living in the same building or um, the same company as another company that's received uh, spending under another name? Are, uh, w what, what kind of um, register number does it have? So you can really find out how much money people get uh, in the end. So um, what you need to do is essentially you need to um, have a list of all companies that are within the space that you're trying to explore. Slide. So um, a, few, a few months ago, um, two British guys called Rob McKinnon and um, Chris Taggart released this site, Open Corporates. It's a list of all companies in the UK and in um, the Cayman Islands, I think. So this is pretty cool. This is the, the kind of stuff you need. They, they use this now on, on uh, the spending data that's being released by the British government to find out who uh, the money actually went to. So can we have this for Germany slide? Um, there is a, a list of our companies. It's called the Unternehmensregister. It's run by this uh, public-private partnership, um, mostly by Bundesanzeige, which is a company. So they have this, and they have some public information on all, um, on all um, companies. But it's really um, a kind of ugly side. It's a session-based thing, so you can't point to companies based on this. And also, you can't really query that in any automated fashion. So I tried to, uh, to download all of the company records. So you start this, and after two days, they stop. They, they block your IP. They send an abuse message to your ISP saying, okay, 
you're, uh, you're fucking up, so you start again. And, and I've done this for a couple of times now. I've, I've kind of spoiled five or six IP addresses, and they're now down to, to blocking me after like half a day of, of scraping. Um, so, so that doesn't really scale because there's a lot, a lot, a lot of records I need to I need to download in order for this to make sense, in order to get get a complete picture of all the companies in Germany. Slide. So over Christmas I sat down and I wrote this uh, small um, application. It's it's got a uh, task managing server and it's got a client um, application that you can install on your laptop. So everyone who's sitting here with a laptop right now, do easy install Flockscrape client. And what you'll do is you'll download a thing that will just allow me to do get requests through your IP address. So that means in order to block, uh, to block all the IPs, they, they now have to block quite a lot of stuff. And if we get a lot of dial-ups using the, this, um, we, we can't be blocked anymore. So please support this. If, if, you know, uh, if you want to improve the application, please contact me, slide. Um, so go to flockscrape.pudo.org if you want to download the application or get some more information on 30 it. 30 seconds, more time at, option. Uh, flockscrape at pudo.org if you want to contact me. Two important notices on this. Number one, it's not a DDoS tool. It's got rate, limit, uh, rate limiting built in. We want the service. We don't want it to go down. It's just to circumvent IP blocking. And number two, um, please help. And if, if you've got other tasks, it's, it's generalizable. So um, as other tasks can be built in and can be scraped. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Great. Uh, that actually started out as a one-off. One slides got updated today. And then just so that I don't have to waste more time saying it, at the 30-second mark, you can ask for more time. So I'm not just going to stop saying that. Any time between 30 seconds and the 10 second countdown, you can ask for more time. And then you as an audience, if you want to give them more time, signal something by doing something like clapping. Practice now. <laughs> and then if the speaker really sucks, you can do something other than clapping like. <laughs> wow, OK, great. So now that we are. We're running five minutes behind Frontis, and, uh, and I have no idea where I'm at in the schedule, so you can, get, you can boo me for that. Boo. All right. Kombucha is up next, so Frontis, are you ready to go? Can I have the hand microphone? Uh, yes, Sven will give you that. Boo. Um, um, yeah, it works. Let me just get this over here. And then timer's up. But I think we'll make it up eventually. So on three, two, one, go. Hi, uh, my name is Franciszek Apfelbeck and I am a food hacker. Uh, I am a member of a hacker space called Noise Bridge, which is in San Francisco. Uh, did everyone visit it, Noise Bridge already? Please hands up. Perfect. So Noise Bridge in the last uh, half year, I would say especially, got quite uh, food hacking heavy. So at least two classes on brewing, cooking every week. Slide please. Uh, so because it's quite popular, I would like to promote it around the world. So I would like to talk today about what is it, why is it a good idea to do it, what you can get out from it, and how you can support it. So, I describe it easy way. You should know what you are doing if you are cooking and brewing. Kind of you open your computer, you should know, you know, where is the graphic card, hard drive, and so on, the same with cooking. Improve it. Think about the ways how you can prepare better meals that you can get more nutrition and it's more tasty and mix some technology in it. There's a plenty of technology which can be used in food hacking. If you do that, please, we are in the open age, so publish it, promote it, make it accessible. Very important. I come, so many times I describe it, combining a traditional knowledge with today's scientific knowledge and with the technology. Because that's where lots of people who are wonderful chefs are very weak. They are very scared of technology. Next slide. Very good example, for example, it's risotto. 
If you cook it, you should know what is rice. There is some starch in it, you know. If you have a white rice, you already take away the most nutrition, which is in the kernel, etc. You should get the top quality ingredients for your cooking. Uh, uh, organic or bio and local based production is a key. We have big problems around the world. You should know about that and learn a bit more. If you cannot get it local, please get fair trade. Great idea. Tasty and healthy. Uh, it's great to eat healthily, but it should be tasty or lots of people will not do it. So please keep it in mind. Uh, preservation. Lots of food you can prepare and it can be preserved for a long periods of time, especially if you use some cultures. Live cultures like yogurt can preserve your food for months on lower temperature if you like. Next slide. Okay, so what I am now doing. Uh, I quit it for now. Uh, United States is what's great but a bit too much for me. And I moved to Europe for a few months preparing for a food hacking trip. So I'm looking for the people One who minute. are... Yep, interested in preparing good, high-quality food, uh, knowing how to do it, learning that, and preferably also helping me to do it with them. So if you are a member of hackerspaces where you think would be good or some co-ops, organizations involved in food preparations, let me know. I'll be around for a whole event. Downstairs, there's a small food hacking uh, area close to lunch. I will teach you yeah, 30 more time. Seconds. Can I have more time? Thank you. So I will basically teach you how to do it tomorrow, by the way, 10 o'clock, 10 a.m., uh, workshop number one. I know, I know. Uh, there is a workshop on under the kombucha yogurts. You can come. I will give you couches for home if you like, you know, so you can do it by yourself. And I will teach you how to do it. Uh, I'm also collecting by this hacker tour, which will be in the next two, three months, uh, money to go to Japan, which is great about uh, food hacking, and I would like to improve their my skills of fermentation especially. I'm fermenting a lot. Next slide, last one. My thanks to hacker movement in general, which is great, open-minded, and it rocks. Noise Bridge as a wonderful hacker space, which is very open-minded about nearly everything. Taste Bridge, a group which I co-founded for working with the food, and this event which I am very glad to attend for the first time. 30 uh, please, seconds. For more information, you can check my web pages or just find me, talk to me downstairs or wherever else. You know, I'm quite easily to distinguish, I guess. Thank you for your attention and have a great time and come for some tasting today. Yep, see ya. <laughs> Excellent. So, all right, now I think we're back on schedule a little bit. Slightly behind, but uh, Bernard, are you ready to go? Yeah. Okay, it's ready on three, two, one, go. Okay, welcome everyone, I'm Bernard, and uh, I've been working on automated testing of operating systems because uh, there are many coders and uh, you want users, uh, but users don't like untested software. So you need testers, but uh, testers also don't like untested software. So you need testing without testers, uh, which is automated testing. Uh, so, slide. Uh, so I did uh, some first scripts uh, which do uh, output cool videos of what is tested, uh, work pretty reliable, reproducible. You can uh, throw in new test modules uh, to have uh, an extra software or code pass uh, tested and it's rather versatile. I did it for OpenSUSE, but I want to do it for uh, Fedora Rawhide, Debian SID, or even BSD. So um, why is it so versatile? Uh, slide. Uh, it's very simple. It's based on KVM, Kernel Virtual Machine, and it uses a uh, monitor uh, console to just do screen dump uh, to see what the VM is doing with the operating system, and it inputs uh, through the send key command things like uh, control alt delete and uh, return return, and uh, will automate the whole install and uh, test applications. 
and figure out uh, which tests uh, passed or which failed. And uh, there's a nice site, um, openqa.opensuse.org, where you can see the results of nightly built uh, tests and how they fared. And this is already in production use, I'd say. And uh, I want to uh, make this bigger. So if you're uh, contributing to Linux distributions or BSD or whatever, you're invited uh, to join automated testing and to make this bigger. So uh, you can see videos on the website if you like. So the slide, uh, pretty much done, yeah. <laughs> And I think that's a new record at two minutes and 29 seconds. So give him a round of applause for that. All right, just another quick note. Uh, when you want to go to your next slide, just say slide, all you have to do. Um, and uh, the one exception we made was for Steve and we arranged that ahead of time. If you're gonna do a lightning talk tomorrow and you would like some kind of arrangement or something beyond the standard. The time to talk to me about it is not when the speaker before you is giving their four minute lightning talk. The time to talk to me about it is earlier in the presentation or mention something in your email. And yes, we do have two or three spaces open for lightning talks. Um, and lightning talks are granted first in order of correctly submitted lightning talks. If you send me, ev if you send me everything you need except your slides, I will send you back an email saying, I need your slides. If another person comes in to the last slot with a properly formatted uh, entry for lightning talks, they will get in and you won't, sadly enough. That's just the way it goes. That's trying to be fair to everybody. More information on that is available in the wiki under the entry lightning talks. And without any further ado, Adrian, are you ready to go? I'm ready. Okay. And so ready on three, one, two, three, go. Okay, hi, my name is Adrian. I'm gonna to talk to you about the stuff that I learned from starting a hackerspace from scratch. The name is Own and One Labs, and it's in Galway, Ireland. Next. That's the latitude of Galway, it's the west, and it's probably the coolest town in, in Ireland. It's the most um, artistic, and there's a lot of alternatives and small strata right across from the sea. Next. So last year was my first time at CCC. We met amazing hackers, Mitch, Sven, and uh, Jimmy, and they inspired us so much because people here work on shit they love doing. Next. So it's interestingly enough, like around the world, hackerspace is like exponentially growing. So you can see from 2004 to 2010, it's just eightfold, which is amazing. Next. So uh, we came back to Galway from Berlin. This guy, we were searching the web, and this guy mentioned, hey, I would like to start a hackerspace in Galway. We thought, oh, that's, that's kind of a big coincidence. So we went to meet this guy. So it was next. Um, it was a few of us just in a coffee shop first, right? Thinking about, okay, well, how are we gonna get this space rolling? And then a few weeks after, Mitch, Mitch Altman from Noisebridge came, came uh, to Dublin and he gave an amazing workshop on electronics and we learned loads from him. He was sharing so much about Noisebridge and his experiences, next. And probably it was three months after that we actually got the space. It's, this is an actual building. It was, it, was meant to, it was meant to be a retail store. So instead of selling shit, you have hackers in that space next. And so as you can see, it's a huge 2,000 square meter space. And it's a wide canvas. It's very close from town. So it's the, amazing, the, the possibilities of doing amazing things here. It's quite great. Next. So this, this was our first meetup. We were thinking about, okay, what's the stuff we're gonna do in this space? What type of people we're gonna bring in? How much money we need? And so on and so forth. Next, then I went into the bathroom and I found this, 404 not found. So I was like, that's a really weird, weird way to 404. It's like, I thought it was a kind of creative thing. That has nothing to do, I just took a photo of it and thought it was kind of cool. Next. So this is our first soldering workshop. It's just a few of us. The space, as you can see, is core and shell. Next. And the other cool event we had was Sugru. Sugru is like this silicon-based substance that you can hack things better with it. Like say, if, you, if your cell phone is fucked up, you can make up a, uh, an alternative boat, uh, button with Sue Group. Next, oh, also, let me just, can you go back? Just, oh, the other interesting thing was there's kids at the space. I thought it was kind of amazing bringing kids. Next, uh, this guy, he's a um, carpenter. 
and he basically managed to do that huge bench and in return, someone taught him how to code. So it's like skill swap completely, that was pretty cool, next. So next thing we had this event called uh, Ignite and we managed to get like a thousand euro into the space. We got a hundred people in a huge diverse of topics and kind of the same format as this, next. And this, we, like as you can see, we had a really cool setup. We had bean bags and One it was a hundred people uh, in the space, so it was kind of very loungy, next. So the other interesting thing was that we managed to portray the projects we were working on when we brought all those people in. And this is kind of a visualization we created. Basically, we mapped out the people who were in the room and how they were related to each other. This is kind of a Facebook map out. Next. And the other graph, this is kind of the project we're working on. Um, we created this visualization of people. So we told people, hey, would you like to find your clone seconds. of people who is around you? So we created that graph. and find the clothes around. So it was kind of fun and engaging thing to, to show people the project we're working on. Next. So really, the thing that I just want to say how community is such an important thing, and I just didn't really get it until starting the Hacker Swiss. In diversity, it's just so important. So can I have more time? One minute. Uh, yeah, so really, I just want to say 10 seconds more. Really, uh, we're, you're, you guys are in Europe, you can get a Ryanair flight. So you wanna go and create like an amazing workshop of, or get more people more involved in your projects, talk to me, my, my, my email is adrian at 091labs.com or just come and talk to me because really, really looking, if you wanna do a tour on food, on what, what not, come over to Galway, thanks. Libra projects, you ready to go? Yep. Okay. No. <clears throat> Hi. Hmm? Yeah, that's the wrong one. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Okay, hey, uh, I'm Jan Christoph Borchardt, and I'm going to tell you about uh, um, a platform I want to start. Um, next, please. Uh, yeah, these are uh, open web services. Um, do you know all of them? I don't know. Um, uh, the problem is, do you use all of them? Or um, are they even that um, known at all? Uh, they, they, that is the problem of these, of these web services, that I, they, are, they solve different problems and are alternatives to, um, let's say, proprietary platforms like Google Maps. We have OpenStreetMap there, and Facebook, Diaspora, uh, and for Twitter, Identica. But they are uh, not that well known. Uh, by the way, if you develop on some of them, uh, I'm going to buy you a drink later. Um, next, please. Yeah, um, Google is doing something on a, a web store that's sadly a proprietary effort. Uh, next, please. Um, also, uh, Mozilla isn't that better uh, with the Gmail and yeah, not that much stuff. So next, please. Um, I'm going to work um, on a directory for uh, free and open projects. So, um, yeah, basically non-discriminating in any way, like free and open, uh, gratis, uh, and uh, platform independent, so web-based, basically. And, uh, no, not next. Um, and also not self-hosted, so um, that everyone can set it up. For the self-hosted part, there's the Freedom Box guys uh, of Debian. Um, shout out to them. And, um, yeah, next, please. Uh, yeah, uh, for normal users, there will be uh, information in uh, categories about the, about the different applications, say Diaspora, Identica, and uh, what are the advantages of these platforms, and of course, uh, links to use it, and also to lower the barrier of participation next, um, opportunities to help, like to code, uh, to test, a bug report, uh, to translate, that's how I got started, and uh, to write documentation, and of course to donate money next. Um, yeah, uh, that is uh, Metcalf's law. It's uh, also called the network effect. Um, if these platforms get uh, advertised, they are also going to get used probably more. And um, basically, what this law says is uh, that uh, if many people use the service, then many more people will use it. So. Um, 
please use open services. Next, please. Oh, uh, that's the wrong one, kind of. Uh, next, please. Um, yeah, uh, it's a kind of a disclaimer. Uh, the project is getting funding uh, by Wikimedia Germany. Uh, thanks for that, by the way. Um, so if you want to join in, go to libreprojects.net. It will uh, bring up this uh, etherpad, which is also uh, free and open source. And uh, yeah. Um, one minute. Thanks. Uh, don't wreck it, please. Um, put in your email or just contact me next um, at uh, janseborchardt at fsfa.org or just, um, yeah, get to me. That would be it. Thanks. That came in at three minutes and 23 seconds. So, this is good? Hi. Um, oh, wait, 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 hold, hold up. Yeah, uh, you, you do need a mic. Well, just a couple of reminder things. Because the word next or words that sound like next are used a little bit more often than words that sound like slide, to advance to the next slide, it would be really helpful if you said slide. Also, if you would rather not stand behind the podium, see Sven. Sven, raise your hand. And Sven will give you a handheld microphone. Otherwise, right before you come up to the podium, be sure to adjust it so that the microphone is pointed at the place where the sound is coming from, your mouth, so that you're not in a situation where, so that you're not in a situation where only some of the sound that you're actually saying is being picked up at any one given time. Um, so with that being said, you got you have your microphone set up, ready to go. You're behind the podium. You've practiced. You're good. Everything's golden. Yeah. Okay. So, and then also let me give me just one quick moment to reset the time clock, and I will let you go. So you are ready. Okay. So in three, two, one, go. Okay. Um, who of you uh, does know a uh, programming language really well? Yeah. Okay. And two of you is sometimes bored. Okay, then this is for you. Slide. Uh, sorry, slide back. <laughs> um, yeah, what, what is a good what is a good program? Um, we all know it. It's performant. It's scalable. It's scalable. It has tests and 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 more and more more. But uh, this is wrong. Slide, please. Yeah, uh, the the real uh, good program slide is just short and uh, slight. This is why we are doing the, the Keras Code Golf Challenge. Code Golf is, uh, you, 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 you've got a, a problem, problem you have to solve and you can use a programming language you like and, and do it in as few characters as possible. So um, the, the, the challenge is already online. You, you can go there, the link will come in a moment, and and it's it's open till tomorrow 4 p.m. So, slide please. You can win bottles of mate. Just come down to the hack center at 4 p.m. tomorrow, and slide please. Yeah, this is uh, the an example challenge. Um, it's just printing some C's. You 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 get a number and and print that much C's. It's pretty easy to implement, but but it's not easy to be the best who implements it in as few characters as possible. And yeah, uh, there are already some really uh, great solutions. So so don't be demotivated by by those. Uh, some of them are even cheated. So just try it. Okay, next slide, please. Yeah, um, this is a challenge number two. It's a little bit more complicated because, um, yeah, it's 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 an RFC and and it's uh, this is uh, the stuff which is used in international domain names to 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 represent Unicode in in ASCII and and actually no one from the Congress uh, already took part. So you can win mat, uh, mate very easy by just. Uh, submitting a working solution. So if you're not so in code golfing, just try it out and, and you can win Mate when you implement it. And it's possible in, in less than half a kil kilobyte. Um, yeah, slide please. The URL is, um, oh, it's, it's, it's just uh, v 
tinyurl.com/27c3golf and you can see all the uh, comments here. Uh, well, actually, if you did have something else to mention, you do have another minute if you wanted to talk. Are you You're good. Okay. Moving right along. Another another thing, since we, we do, well, since we are short on time and I don't have time to ask every presenter the exact pronunciation of their name, don't forget to introduce yourself um, when you're on stage. And also, just another quick reminder, if you want more time, you can ask for more time from the audience between the one minute warning and, or, I'm sorry, between the one minute warning and the 10 second warning. But after the 10 second warning, if you ask for more time, it may be difficult to get that. So if you ask for more time and the audience wants to give it to you, they will do. And if you've been giving the audience something that they don't like and they don't want to grant you more time, they will do something like. So with that being said, are you ready to go? Okay, also don't forget to adjust your microphone before you go. And that's, if you want, if you need to look at the screen to see what your slides are, do it in such a way so that your microphone is point, so that your microphone is still pointed at your mouth. Don't do something like this where you're looking at the screen and then going to the microphone and looking at the screen and going at the microphone because that, yeah. that is Good. annoying to the audience and even Good. more annoying to the folks who are watching the streams at home. So now, with all of those pro tips covered in three, two, one, go. Hello, I'm Kirill Salviovs from the University of Latvia. I'm a master's student and I had a master's thesis on Skype and I did end up changing the subject. So that's one reason why I'm making this presentation. Slide, please. So um, who, uses, who has used Skype here for communication actually? Raise hand. And who is still using it? Okay, most of you. Cool. So uh, I'm not using it anymore for communication, though I will, would still like to do some experiments. And uh, even though this presentation is about Skype, it can be applied to basically any closed source software research you might be doing, most of the parts. Slide, please. Um, so these are reasons why some would, some would like to explore software. And uh, I'd like to see results come live, and so far, all Skype research, mostly, uh, since the silver, silver, needle, silver Needle in Skype has gone somewhere. So people announce it and don't present. Uh, and I think I know why. Next slide, please. So what actually happens as soon as Skype finds out that you have a research, slide, please, is that you get a sexy blonde girl next, door, uh, next day at your door requiring signature for a letter of, of something like stop doing that. Um, so these slides will be online later, uh, so you can read all, all here, Next slide please. And they actually require you to sign this. So they, this is not what I wrote, they gave you, they give you a paper, something like NDA, but it doesn't have to do much with NDA. So basically, uh, I didn't sign this, and in case you get one of those, I wouldn't recommend to sign them too. Again, this will be online later, slide please. Um, so what to do when you get those? Here are some points. If you have a lawyer, that's cool. If you don't, well, you're not fucked, but you'll on your own, kind of. And if you signed for receiving the letter, please make sure that you don't just put in the drawer. It will, it will end badly, so you should actually reply to that. Um, and a good reply would be, I don't, I'm not intending to do anything illegal, and that's it. So you send that out and see what they, what they do next. So don't sign stuff. Um, next slide, please. They might react to your uh, letter asking faster channels of communication like email, telephone calls, and so on. Um, I would not recommend going there because in most jurisdictions, you can only go to court later and prove that there's something wrong if you have actually written stuff where they have their signatures. So always try to keep to written communication by post, actually. Slide, please. And here are some general tips on how to deal with such situations. So as I already mentioned, you communicate only in writing. Slide, please. And you answer to the inquiries. If they ask you something, here's a question, you answer how to do that. Um, so slide, please. 
or you can also opt to not answer if you have a good reason, like some of these. One minute. You, of course, can also try the last part by approach, like uh, making fun of them, but then, of course, you're gonna go to court, and if you're sure that you're right, it's not a problem, in case you enjoy going to court. Uh, so you can try that. Slide, please. You should always inform them upon the first letter which jurisdiction you think you're in. So if you have disagreement on that, it might turn seconds. out important letter. Can I ask for a minute more? Uh, always inform on jurisdiction. It will, it may come up later. Slide, please. And be proactive, so attack them, actually. Here are some points what to do. You can start a separate communication, a new letter sent to them, actually saying what you think they're doing wrong, which rights are they, um, are they interfering with, and so on. Uh, but don't try to accuse them and think if One they haven't minute. done anything bad. It's illegal. Okay, next slide. Uh, you can also contact the Bar Association, which is like a body of lawyers in that country, and complain. Slide, please. And you can complain to Data Protection Agency. For example, I have no idea still where they got my address from. Slide, please. Here are parties I, I was in communication during this with. So uh, Skype people are sorted in order of increasing nastiness in communication. So the first guy is actually quite a good guy. In case you, you, get, in case you get to talk with Adrian Asher, uh, just hang up, just don't talk to him. He's Chief Information Security Officer at Skype. He doesn't know anything about the code, so he's no use to you. Um, okay, slide please. Oh, solutions for WIMPs, how to actually, like a summary, is here, work alone, don't talk to Skype and so on, and slide please. And this is solutions for heroes. Slide please, URL has a presentation. I think that's pretty impressive. 20 slides in basically exactly five minutes. So, and, and dealing with me giving him lots of tips and things like that. Give, give him a round of applause. I thought that was pretty good. Okay. Um, you, you just emailed me as in after 11, 11 a.m.? Actually, I'm, I'm just gonna, I, I, I'm, I'm prone to say, let's, let's run with the slides that you emailed me yesterday. The, the time to send me new equipment is not after the lightning talks have already begun. <laughs> it's a little bit difficult for me. So, so let's throw this one out to the audience. Should I make her run with the slides that she sent me about eight hours ago? Oh, the, the, the audience has spoken. You're gonna have to run with it, sorry. Just me, I'll just talk to you. It's too bad, pictures are nice. Okay, so in three, two. All right, so I'm Ann Harrison and I work with the Benetech Human Rights Data Analysis Group. We're a US nonprofit that's been analyzing large scale human rights violations for 20 years. We work with prosecutors, international courts and truth and reconciliation commissions and we work to end impunity. With all the debate about WikiLeaks, it's important to remember that previously secret government documents sometimes provide key evidence needed to hold national leaders and security forces accountable for human rights violations. Careful analysis is essential to make sure this evidence holds up in court. We use open source tools such as the R statistical software and statistical techniques like multiple systems estimation. We analyze large data sets to accurately estimate how many people were killed or disappeared in a given conflict, how many were never counted, and who is responsible for these crimes. This year, we reviewed analysis done by the Iraq Body Count Project on civilian casualties in Iraq. This data was collected from press reports and administrative records. They compared their data to civilian Iraqi deaths documented in the WikiLeaks Significant Acts or SIGACS database. The Iraq body count found considerable overlap between the two data sets. Based on their comparison, our analysts used multiple systems estimation to calculate that an additional 6,000 civilian deaths were likely undocumented by both sources. This year, we also analyzed data from the Guatemalan National Police Archive, which was discovered in 2005 in a former munitions warehouse in Guatemala City. It contains an estimated 31 million documents it's the largest known human rights archive in the Americas. 
At the invitation of the Guatemalan government, we developed a system to sample and analyze these records. Three teams of archivists now work around the clock to sample, clean, and scan these documents and back them up to servers outside the country. Our analysis was recently used to prosecute two former Guatemalan police officers for the 1984 disappearance of labor activist Edgar Fernando Garcia. Garcia was one of an estimated 40,000 Guatemalans who disappeared during the country's 36 years of armed internal conflict. We calculated the percentage of documents known by different police units. We supported the prosecution's argument that high-level officers were involved in Garcia's disappearance. In October, both officers were found guilty and sentenced to 40 years in prison apiece. The verdicts established forced disappearance as a crime in Guatemala and has led to the investigation of high-ranking officers, and that investigation is ongoing. This year in Africa, we also released analysis of a cache of prison records generated by the former state security force in Chad, the DDS, the Documentation and Security Directorate. Our analysis showed that former Chadian President Hissine Habre was well informed of the hundreds of prison deaths that occurred during his regime. These files were discovered by Human Rights Watch and an abandoned DDS headquarters, and they contain detailed accounts of the interrogation, movement, and deaths of prisoners as well as information One on minute. the internal functioning of the DDS. More? <laughs> Thank you. Habre has been accused of killing and systematically torturing thousands of political opponents. Representatives from the EU, the African Union, Chad, and other countries agreed last month to finance Habre's trial. Prosecutors can use this analysis to show Habre's personal responsibility for the prison deaths. And this month marks 20 years since prisoners were released from Habre's jails. We encourage more extensive sharing of available human rights data. Our local NGO and human rights partners often place themselves at great risk to gather this kind of information. Our analysts strive for meticulous objectivity and academic rigor that persuades relevant parties to talk about human rights in ways that impact the political process. Please visit our website, that's hrdag.org, to read more about our projects or to help fund our work. Thank One you very minute. much. And okay, for those of you just joining us, uh, the way this works is we have presenters, they sent in slides. When they want to advance their slide, they say slide at the they have four minutes normally. However, between the time I say one minute and I do the 10 second countdown, they can ask for more time. And if the audience wants to give them a one minute extension, the audience will go like. <laughs> and if you think the talk totally sucks and the audience doesn't want to give it to you, they will go. And when you have exactly 10 seconds left, the audience will go. And shockingly, I don't think we've had a situation where the audience has even gotten to zero. So are you ready to go? You've got the handheld microphone. You're good. Yeah. You're ready to introduce yourself. And I will give you a three, two, one, go. Hi. It's, uh, it's a great pleasure to be in front of such a crowd. That's all I wanted to say as a first off. So my name is Mate Shosh, and I, I work on Crypto Minister. It's a set solver. So uh, set solvers, um, I don't know if you, you took uh, computer science classes, but basically uh, they're the def very definition of hard. So uh, they're meant to be ex exponentially difficult to, to solve. And, uh, and uh, strangely enough, they're quite f easy to use and uh, they're, they're really, really fast. So they're meant to be exponential, you know, in the number of variables, but it turns out that you can solve problems of extreme size with them. And uh, actually, lots and lots of, um, of companies are doing this. So they're using this for every single CPU you have, you have they are actually validated using this, this technique, set solvers. And um, I'm using it for cryptographic, uh, for, for cryptography. So basically, I'm, I'm trying to break cryptographic primitives with it. I don't know if you remember, we broke the, the London Underground uh, system. This thing can, well, it used to be able to break it in about 20 seconds. It was a 48-bit cipher. I think it can do it in less than five now. I, I'm not going to test, but. 
the thing is that I've been doing this for one year. Uh, we, we, we won the, uh, the set race of, uh, of this year, so there's a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a sort of a competition every year. And uh, this, is, this is completely free software. And actually, the source code was available, and we beat 20 people, you know, all the research, research uh, uh, groups and, and groups of people and all of that with, with software that they could have just downloaded and, 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 and sent to the competition. So anyway, uh, this is, this is a, a graph that says, but it basically shows how, how many problems, a set of problems we can solve uh, uh, within a certain time limit. And, and I used to be able to solve 213, and, and then I moved to 216, and people were saying, yeah, this is the limit, this is the limit, you're approaching. And then I saw 219, and they were like, yeah, yeah, but now it's like the limit now. And so now like 221, and they were keeping like, no, no, this is the theoretical limit now. And so it's 223, and it's like, and we just keep on moving. So there's, there's, there's no limit, there's no limit. And I think, I think you, you could join this, this, this uh, development process, and I'm doing this, well, mostly alone, I would say 80% is being done by me and there's a development team that is doing the rest. And if you could join, I think we could move this, this curve right off the scale and uh, we could really make a difference. And, and this is not only a difference in terms of crypto, which interests me, but it could be something else that interests you. For instance, software radiation. This is being used in software for, for software uh, verification. It's being used as hardware verification, as I said. It's being used in bioinformatics. This, this, this kind of uh, system can be used in, in, in many scenarios. Uh, you come up with it. Uh, there have been, been people trying to uh, break um, uh, some really difficult puzzles with this, and I don't know if you know, there was a one puzzle minute. challenge that for one million dollars, uh, and while well, they haven't bre broken it with, with, with this uh, set solver, but uh, you know they've been making progress. So join the community. Uh, it's Crypto Minisat. Uh, just talk to me right here, or just Google uh, Crypto Minisat and uh, send me a letter, and we can we can we can work on this. Thank you very much for your time. And with that, we are going to take a quick 10-minute stretch break. So be back here at 12.50 while we load up the next slides and so we don't have... Yep, yeah, get up, get up. <laughs>